tell me with whom you associate, and I will tell you who you are. So said Goethe, a German poet from the 19th century. Now, of course, Goethe is speaking something worldly. Himself, at that time, saying, I'm a Christian, but I don't agree with anything the church says. So in the 19th century, that's shorthand for being an atheist. That's basically what he was. Show me who you hang out with, and I will judge you according to that. And I won't give any wiggle room, says Goethe. The Samaritan man corrupted by leprosy had this same issue. And remember, it doesn't say ten lepers, as if that is the defining thing of these ten men. Yes, to the world, that's how they're defined, but not by God. These are not just ten lepers, but ten men corrupted by leprosy. Therefore, in need of cleansing. But how the world sees it, how these men see themselves, is as nothing but lepers. Because there's no such thing as a Samaritan leper or a Jewish leper or a Roman leper or a Greek leper or a Gallic leper or a Celtic leper. You're just a leper. They throw you into a cave, put you out on an island or up on a mountain to die. Now, even in the Mosaic law, as you read in Leviticus 13, verse 45, these leprous men are supposed to cry out one thing and one thing only when they stand at a distance from everybody. They are supposed to cry out, Tame, unclean, unclean. Not just their flesh being unclean and foul, but unclean in the eyes of God, foul in his presence. And that is the company that the Samaritan kept. And we don't know, I mean, we can assume these other nine were Jews, right? Because they don't come back and Jesus in the end says, this foreigner, so that's the assumption, but we all know what happens when we assume. So we mustn't do that. We don't know if these other nine men were Israelites. All we know is they were unclean, just like the one Samaritan was. And they cry out only that. Bad company. And do you and I not keep bad company? Remember St. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 33, bad company corrupts good morals. And the company we keep may have nothing to do with Christ. Yes, we read those sins from St. Paul and we love the beginning ones and the ones right at the end, right? The sensuality and the homosexuals and the abortionists and all those wicked people out there. <laughs> but my favorite one that's mentioned in this laundry list of transgressions, right? Remember the fruit of the spirit, but the wickedness, the plurality of the evil stuff of the flesh, my favorite one is it says in English fits of anger as if you occasionally blow up a little bit or sometimes get angry. You hulk out sometimes. Well, that's not what it says. What it says there is one who is never satisfied in their anger. One who always has to find a reason to be angry. So the best translation for that verse in Galatians is Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Never happy, never content. Even if the service is fantastic, the hymn choice is phenomenal, we sang your favorites and the sermon is filled with nothing but gospel declaration, you'll still find something to complain about and get upset about. Ergo, Lutheran. <laughs> but it's easy to condemn the bad company out there that I don't hang out with, but what about that which I hang out with within the context of church? For any company you keep within the life of the church that has nothing to do with Christ is bad company. It is not good. Even sanctified by a false Christ, for that is what we put on it, it is not good and must die. For it is tame, unclean. Guta would look only at that and see no way of escape. No redemption. 
Thanks be to God, Jesus is not some 19th century German poet, but our merciful Lord, who in seeing us, we who are bad company associates, he sees the 10 men corrupted by leprosy, and unlike everybody else in that era that would stand away because they would become unclean, foul before the Father. He comes up to them, draws near to them as they cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, pity us, heal us, grant us your peace, your well-being. Jesus does it. He says, go and show yourselves to the priest. And before they can even get there to start any form of purification themselves, they are made clean. for Christ associated with them. And he associates with you. He comes and makes company with you and takes on all that is bad about you as his own. Your fits of anger, your idolatry, your sensuality, your divisiveness, your dissension, your drunkenness, all taken by Christ as his own. And on the cross does the law find him as an associate of sinners, tax collectors, sinners, those in need of cleansing. And Jesus doesn't say, no, I never hung out with them. No, I never affiliated myself with them. No, I never associated myself with them. No, he remains silent and on the cross dies in our stead and in our place. In our place, meaning that deeper understanding that Christ has taken everything that is you and all that the law saw on the cross was you and your frailty, your fallenness, your weakness. And there did Jesus satisfy the wrath of the Father completely. That in this blessed exchange, you may receive all that is good about him. That in the same manner he associated with your depravity, you are now an associate of his righteousness one who is made clean, forgiven all your sins. For so was the Samaritan who came back to Jesus, who returned to Christ, bowing down at his feet, giving glory to God. And Jesus says, rise up, son, and journey on, pilgrim on your way. Your faith has saved you, for it has grasped my word and clung to it alone. And the company you now keep by faith is the company of Christ. For his way is Jesus' way. And it is the same for you. One thing I can't stand about Lutheranism, hey, maybe too strong a word, but it's getting close to that, is how we do baptisms. I can't stand sprinkling. And that's the Lutheran way, right? Lutherans have always sprinkled. That is what we do. Why don't we dunk? Well, that's what Baptists do. And evangelicals. And we're not that. Isn't it funny how our practice is always based on what we're not rather than who we are? It's like, well, we're not Roman Catholic and we're not Baptist. So we can't do anything that could ever relate to one or the other. But the reality is dunking is so beautiful. In fact, Luther wrote and said he preferred that way of baptizing. Because when you sprinkle that little bit on the forehead, it's like, all right, maybe later you won't get forehead acne, dear child. But the dunking symbolizes and shows the reality that you are cleansed from head to toe, top to bottom. If you look at Lucas Cronach's painting of baptism in his Weimar altarpiece, Philip Melanchthon is not baptizing the head, but the tuchus, the filthy part of man, to show that even the worst of you is made clean. That Christ has claimed you completely. No matter the baggage, no matter the mistakes, no matter the false hopes, no matter the bargains you've made with God, no matter the deals you've made with God, the vows you've made to Him and broken on a daily basis, He claims you head to toe, body and soul, completely as His very own and says, join my company, join me as one who has gone through death unto life eternal and abide in the forgiveness I have won for you, dear child. 
says Jesus. But then enters the hard part. He bids you come and be company with others as well. So be not like the nine that had nothing to do with the Samaritan and who went their own way. As I said to the early service saints, I say to you as well, as I say to my own sons, if you desire to live in grudges and not forgiveness, get out. Leave. Why are you here? If you want to be in my house, you will love and forgive. And you can say, well, pastor, this is Jesus' house, not yours. You're right. Yet what type of pastor would I be if I acted like a bad teenage babysitter who watched pay-per-view and left the dishes unclean in the sink and didn't care about how the kids acted while you're gone? You are called to live as Christ is for you. To keep good company. Even if Jesus has invited someone worse than you on the pilgrimage, rejoice. Rejoice that he has claimed someone else as his own along with you. And said, they are mine as well. For you will never be burdened or cursed to love someone that Christ loves. If Jesus forgives them unconditionally, so do you. He's done the same for you. So may you be freed from any bitterness, resentment, and anger. And instead, rise up and pilgrim on with Christ in the blessed assurance that you are 100% loved, absolutely forgiven, unconditionally claimed forever. Oh yes, my friends. Show me with whom you associate, and I will tell you who you are. By grace alone, you are an associate of Christ. You are a blessed saint, forgiven all your sins. Though great your sin, yet greater still is his abundant favor for you. So pilgrim on, brothers and sisters. It's going to be a joyful time here in time as we wait to celebrate unto eternity together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.